hi guys welcome to neditech reviews today we will be looking at the nubian red magic 3 gaming phone this is the best gaming phone yet less than two years ago gaming phones weren't even a thing but now they are an entire category unto themselves asos made one xiaomi made one with another one on the way for xiaomi and razer made two and why there are some people that continue to question why they are even necessary it's important to note that the superb 90 hz screen on the oneplus 7 pro is almost certainly a response to the high refresh rate screens that first debuted on various gaming phones these phones influences the broader category of phones but in the case of the nubian red magic 3 that might not be a good thing i'm not sure i want to see its built-in fan in next year's oneplus still its features like this and an excellent price that makes this the best gaming phone yet seriously the red magic 3 has pretty much everything you could ever want in a gaming phone it's got a huge 6.6 .6 inch screen with a 90 hertz refresh rate stereo speakers the latest snapdragon 855 chip from qualcomm 8 gigabyte of ram and 128 gigabyte of storage and of course an rgb light strip around the back it even has a red and black color scheme that delivers that classic game aesthetics and why its triangular accents on the back are a bit aggressive they are not overly so like the razer phone 2 the red magic 3 has powerful stereo speakers but to make the phone even more pleasant to hold while gaming nubian gave its gaming phone curvy sides and rounded corners so that it doesn't jab your palm like razer phones does and while the red magic 3 still has bezels above and below its screen they are smaller than what's on the razer phone 2 and also quite proportional which gives the phone which gives the old device a satisfying and balanced look and feel while a while which is good because this thing is heavy between its 6.65 .6 inch amoled 2340 by 1080 screen and its thick metal back the red magic 3 is absolute is an absolute unit when viewed side by side next to the galaxy note 9 or oneplus 6 pro the red magic 3 it is noticeably larger than both but that thick body comes with its benefits because it means the red magic 3 has room for a sim tray with an extra micro sd card slot a headphone jack and nubia's hidden party trick a built-in active cooling fan like you would get on a gaming pc at first putting a fan in a phone seems like a silly idea but when you think about it some more you start to wonder why not it is the enemy of performance and anyone who's played pugb mobile has almost certainly noticed how warm a phone can get after just a couple of rounds but putting a phone putting a fan in a phone only makes sense if that fan actually helps cool the device so to test its effectiveness i performed two stress tests that involves running 3d max slingshot extreme graphics test 10 times in a row to simulate a demanding gaming session the first test was with no help from the fan and the second test was was with the fan turned on to full blast and you know what sadly it seems that the fan is more of a style than function after 10 rounds of slingshot extreme without the fan the red magic 3 posted a score of 5051 compared to a score of 5255 with the phone's fan set on full blast that's an increase of just under five percent which isn't nothing but not quite enough to really make a difference the red magic 3 posted a score of 6354 when one after a cold boot however however during additional testing in i noticed that having the fan turned when you first fire up some games doesn't help prevent your hand from getting sweaty so at least you know when you hear that tiny hand dryer spin up you are getting everything you can out of red magic 3 while gaming 
The Red Magic 3. The Red Magic 3's built-in fan isn't its only gaming feature. As Nubian gave the phone a dedicated gaming mode, completely with its own address switch. At first, I thought the red slider on the side of the phone was a mode switch or an alert toggled like you get on iPhone or OnePlus One phone. But no, flipping that switch activates a dedicated UI that puts all your gaming apps front and center while also giving you a handful of special features and live system info. With the Red Magic, with the Red Magic's gaming mode turned on, you can see the temperature inside the phone, the clock speed of your CPU and GPU, and even the speed of your data connection. There are nifty shortcuts for taking screenshots, blocking incoming messages, toggling the fan on and off, and something called 4D shock, which basically adds a rumble effect to select games. Unfortunately, right now, the list of supported titles stand at just 4, PUGB Mobile, PUGB Mobile, Knives Out, Asphalt 9, and QQ Speed. But my favorite gaming feature of them all is Nubian's touch button controls, which lets you customize the Red Magic's two side mounted touchpad so you can use them as shoulder buttons. It's perfect for Battle Royale games like Fortnite and PUGB. And because the touch controls can be adjusted for whatever you are playing, there is no limit to the possibilities. However, all of these tools and features do take some time to get used to, as booting straight into gaming mode can be overwhelming at first. There are also a ton of different settings for the Red Magic 3's rear RGB light strip, which can be accessed from the phone's gaming mode or customized in the standard Android settings menu. The Red Magic 3 software is my biggest letdown, because while the phone doesn't come with, while the phone does come with Android 9. I ran into a couple of situations where the phone froze or got hung up temporarily. None of these situations were more than a minor inconvenience and were typically fixed by closing an app and restarting it. But still, issues like that shouldn't happen at all. On top of that, despite getting a new system update at the end of June, the phone is still running on Google's Android security patch for March. At least the Red Magic 3's battery life is strong. With a time of 13 hours and 15 minutes on our rundown test, the Red Magic 3 crushes the Razer Phone 2's time of 9 hours 45 minutes and also topped the ROG Phone's time of 12 hours 57 minutes. As for the Red Magic 3's 48 megapixel camera, despite having just a single lens, which is actually something which is actually somewhat refreshing in today's world of double, triple, and quadruple camera phones. Its image quality is decent. In bright light, the Red Magic 3's picture looked sharp, though not as colorful as those from competitors. And at night, it even grabbed a shot with better white balance than what I got from a Galaxy S10. But overall, the Red Magic 3's camera is clear step down for what you would get on a flagship phone from Apple, Samsung, or Google. That's okay, it's not really the main function or the main focus of the phone anyway. But here is the real shocker. The Red Magic 3 cost just $480. That's more than $300 less than the Razer Phone 2 and about $400 less than Asus ROG phone for better specs, longer battery life, more colorful lights and a wide array of gaming features. And if that's not enough, there's a higher spec model with 12GB of RAM and 256GB of storage and a camo paint job plus Nubian's optional controller accessory and optional desktop dock. I wish Nubian put a bit more polish on the Red Magic software and spend more time providing timely security updates. Yet, for mobile gaming fanatics looking for a big phone at a great price, the Red Magic 3 can't be denied. In summary, the Red Magic 3 has a dedicated gaming switch and a built-in fan for better cooling along with an obligatory RGB light strip in the back. The Red Magic 3 works best on GSM cell networks. While the Red Magic 3 has a ton of gaming features, it doesn't come with wireless charging. 
NFC or any kind of water resistance. Thanks to its 6.65 inch AMOLED screen and thick metal back, the Red Magic 3 is a bit of a tanker. The Red Magic 3 has two other small annoyances. Its stereo speakers aren't perfectly balanced and it only and it only has its 02.11 AC Wi-Fi. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Hi guys, welcome to Nerdy Tech Reviews. Today we will be looking at the $400 Google Pixel 3a. Completely redefines great bang for your buck. Last year, the Pixel 3 proved that it's possible to use software to create a thoughtful phone that's just as powerful and sometimes easier to use than competitors crammed full of the latest IN components. But for a phone that started at $800, it would have been nice to get a few extra bonus features like reverse wireless charging or an extra camera or two in the back. With the Pixel 3a, however, Google has crammed all the nifty Pixel softwares and AI enhanced features into a phone that cost half the price. And in the process, Google made the best value phone on the market. With the Pixel 3a starting at just $400 or $480 for the Pixel 3a XL. The first thing you wonder about is what kind of sacrifices Google had to make to get the price that low. From the outside, those differences are hard to spot as the Pixel 3a remains the Pixel 3's trademark design, right down to the phone's two-tone back, brightly colored power button and soft touch finish. It's really only after you hold the 3A and a regular Pixel 3 side by side that you notice that it's constructed out of polycarbonate that is plastic instead of glass, which gives it an even so slightly warmer, less slippery feel, along with a little less heft as well. Meanwhile, for the Pixel 3A XL, the big difference between Google's new mid-range handset and the standard Pixel 3 XL is the lack of a notch. In its place, the Pixel 3a XL features larger bezels around its 6-inch display. Google also moved one of the Pixel 3's front-facing speakers to the bottom of the phone, which gives the 3a XL a bit of a chin. But thankfully, that new bottom-mounted speaker has been paired with the earpiece up notch so that the phone still delivers stereo sound. On the Pixel 3a XL, on the Pixel 3a XL, Google also cut the phone's resolution from the Pixel 3 XL's 2960 by 1440 down to 2160 by 1080, which means if you look closely, you will notice a small reduction in the sharpness of text and photos. But that's really nitpicking. And since the Pixel 3a screen still features an OLED display, it doesn't lack any of the rich and vibrant colors we got on the original Pixel 3 screen. As for its guts, the biggest change for the Pixel 3a is the use of the Qualcomm Snapdragon 670 processor as opposed to the Snapdragon 845 chip. But once again, unless you are really, unless you are tr really trying to stretch the system, it's hard to pick out any big dips in everyday performance. If you look closely, occasionally you will see a tiny bit of stutter or lag when flipping between apps or scrolling through menus. Why games like PUGB Mobile, PUBG Mobile don't run quite as smoothly as they might on a phone with a beefier chip. On a $400 phone, anyway, these kinds of e-cups are pretty inoffensive. The Pixel 3 is 4GB of RAM and 64GB of storage are in line 
with what you would expect from a handset in this price range. And when it comes to battery life, the 3000 mAh battery in the Pixel 3a lasted an admirably 11 hours and 51 minutes. On our video rundown test, while the 3700 mAh battery in the Pixel 3a XL fared even better at 12 hours for 3 minutes for the Pixel at 12 hours for 3 minutes. For the Pixel 3a, that's half an hour longer than what we got from a regular Pixel 3 XL at 11 hours 24 minutes and almost a full hour for the Pixel 3a XL. Critically, Google hasn't messed with the Pixel 3a's rear camera with features the same with which features the same camera sensors and optics found on the standard Pixel 3. However, you do you do lose out on the secondary wide angle selfie cam found on the front of the standard Pixel 3. And while the 3A doesn't have Google's dedicated Pixel Visual Core chip to help handle image processing, Google customized the 3A's photo pipeline to ensure that the 3A won't lose out in a head-to-head -head shootout against a regular Pixel 3. That's a pretty big claim. But after comparing a number of photos of photos shot by both phones, Google totally delivered. A $400 phone has never had a camera this good. Across almost every situation and environment, the Pixel 3a produced the same color-rich HDR plus pictures I got from a standard Pixel 3 while also retaining all of Pixel 3's special shooting modes such as Super Res Zoom Photo Boot Mode which now has a cut new kiss detection feature and most importantly Night Sight Google even added a new time lapse feature to the Pixel 3a which is, which is also adding to older Pixel phones that's that lets you turn that that lets you turn long recordings into significantly shorter clip with options for five times 10 times 30 times or even 120 times speeds to test this out i use the time lapse mode to capture the fading light from sunset as it washed over some nearby mountains and fields considering a five minute clip into a short 15 condensing a five minutes clip into a short 15 second movie creating the time lapse creating the time lapse couldn't have been simpler all i had to do was select the speed of the time lapse and then hit record now to be clear time lapse mode on phones aren't exactly a groundbreaking feature but the final clip is crisp and smooth with the only thing distracting from the speed up movement of the clouds being the cloud or being the cloud of insect that shows up as little black dots that dart across the frame. My big re regret is really that I wish I had had more time to grab a longer recording. For stock Android fans who still long for Google's old Nexus phones. Your champion is here with a plastic back, a built-in headphone jack, and pure Android experience. The Pixel 3a feels like the true spiritual successor to Nexus 5. The only thing you don't get is a removable battery, which is something almost no phone have anymore. My only real concern about the Pixel 3a is whether it will suffer from the same sort of quality control issues and bugs that plagued the early days of the Pixel 3. Not only does the $400 Pixel 3a fills a big gap in the budget mid-range market, I would argue that anyone who was previously thinking about getting a $300 Moto G7 should seriously consider spending a bit more for a Pixel 3a. And why the Pixel 3a doesn't have the pure compute power to match something like the OnePlus 60 
between Google's HDR Plus photography, the availability of day one updates and bonuses like duplex and unlimited picture storage in Google Photos, the Pixel 3a might be an even better value that's also friendlier to use. In the end, why Google made a handful of compromises to create the Pixel 3a, every change makes sense and feels thoughtfully considered. When you factor in the Pixel 3 is much more affordable price tag, all those trade-offs are totally worth it. For a $400 phone, the Pixel 3a is a triumph. It looks like a pixel, it feels like a pixel, and it damn sure snaps pictures like a pixel. In some way, between its plastic body, the return of a headphone jack, and stock Android, the Pixel 3a is the spiritual successor to the Nexus phones of hold. Featuring a Snapdragon 670 processor, the Pixel 3a isn't quite as snappy as its more expensive siblings, but you still get great battery life and an excellent camera. The Pixel 3a doesn't have an official water resistance ratings, but Google says it should survive an occasional splash or rain shower. The Pixel 3a's time-lapse mode is the latest new feature for Pixel phones and it will be rolling out to previous Pixels too. With the Pixel 3a, Google is committing to 3 years of software updates, so there's no worry about it getting abandoned anytime soon. The Pixel 3a won't be Verizon exclusive as it will be available from T-Mobile, Sprint, US Cellular and Google Fi. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Bye. Hi guys. Next on Nandy Tech Reviews, we would look at the Huawei P30 Pro. Huawei rewrote the rules for smartphone cameras with the P30 Pro. Despite how you might feel about its rumored ties to the Chinese government or lack of, Huawei has undeniably made some of the most technologically advanced phones of the last three years. Huawei released the first handsets with triple rear cameras and reverse wireless charging, while also beating its biggest, biggest rivals, Apple and Samsung, to the market with phones featuring in-screen in -screen fingerprint sensors and dedicated neural processing units. But for Huawei's latest flagship phone, the P30 Pro, Huawei was faced with a difficult challenge. Traditionally, Huawei's P series phones have Huawei's P series phones have pushed camera innovations, but after leveraging AI to help tune camera settings and putting three cameras on the back of its phones, what else was there left to improve? Sure, Huawei could have kept increasing the number of cameras on its phones like we've seen on the Nokia 9, but in some ways this feels a bit too obvious. So instead, Huawei chose to completely re-engineer the way camera sensors work to achieve better low light performance. Then Huawei tagged on an unprecedented 5 times optical zoom lens just for kicks. You see, inside almost every modern digital camera, there's an image sensor with a Bayer filter featuring a repeating 4 pixel grid that uses 2 green pixels, 1 red pixel and 1 blue pixel to capture light and color. It's a fundamental system employed by practically every camera company, not named Fujifilm, but it's not perfect. For the P30 Pro, Huawei changed up the formula by replacing the green color filter in a buyer filter with yellow ones, with the reasoning being that yellow is a lighter color than green. 
which allows more light to pass through the filter than and hits the sensors behind it. More light means brighter images, which when you are out and about snapping pictures in low light, it's precisely what you want. However, while that might sound like a simple switch, it's really an enormous amount of work. Once you change the way a camera's color filter functions, you need to resign its image processor, the thing that interprets the data the camera sensors captures. How those images are shown on a display, all of the camera's various photo modes, and a bunch of other stuff. So, has all of Huawei's effort paid off? Actually, yes. With its new sensor, the P30 Pro on auto mode can more or less match the excellent low light capacity or capability of Google's night sight processing without any extra tuning or special settings. That also means less hassle too, because now you don't have to pause and hold the camera steady for four or five seconds as you do, as you do for with most dedicated night modes. Just tap the shutter, try not to shake your hands for a bit, and that's it. When you compare shots from the P30 Pro to phones like Galaxy S10 or Pixel 3, the difference is obvious. For example, in a nighttime shot at a nearby park, while a photo captured by the Galaxy S10 Plus looks alright because the S10 needed to set the shutter speed at one ninth of a second, even with the phone's optical image stabilization, objects in the S10 Pix appear significantly blurrier. Meanwhile, a face-off between the P30 Pro on auto and the Pixel 3 without night sight turned on shows how much of a head start Huawei's new sensors really provides. If I didn't know better, someone could have easily fooled me by saying the P30 Pro shot of the scooter on auto mode was taken on a sunny afternoon and not almost midnight, which is when I snapped the picture. And even after I enabled Night Sight on the Pixel 3, the P30 Pro's picture still featured sharper details and captured an image that looked more accurate to what I saw with my eyes. While the Pixel 3's Night Sight mode did a good job of removing the heavy color cast that came from nearby streetlights, the P30 Pro's photo is, is superior in almost every other way. Of course, Huawei's, Huawei has its own dedicated night mode as well, which adds an extra level of details to challenging low light shots. Though I found that because the P30 Pro's auto mode was so good, I didn't feel the need to use it nearly as much compared to the, P30, compared to the Pixel 3, which basically necessitates the use of night sight when the lights go down. That said, Huawei's new sensor isn't perfect because while it has dramatically improved the P30's, P30 Pro's low light performance, it seems to have slightly negatively impacted the P30 Pro's bright light shooting. When compared to both the Galaxy S10 and Pixel 3, a daytime shot of some flowers from the P30 Pro has way more bloom out highlights and more muted colors in the surrounding in the surrounding greenery. I suspect this is some work, something Huawei can improve over time, as this could be an effect of Huawei's having to redesign its camera stack to accommodate that new sensor. But at least right now, there is a trade-off. Also, I should mention that Huawei only uses its custom RYYB sensors on the main camera not the P30 Pro's 20 megapixel ultra wide camera or its 8 megapixel telephoto cam. It's an understandable move, though it can be a bit 
jarring when switching between lenses especially if you are shooting videos now if the only thing Huawei had done was upgrade the P30 Pro's main camera sensor would have been enough but it didn't because for the P30 Pro's telephoto camera Huawei added a new system with a 5 time optical zoom what Huawei claim is a 10 time loseless zoom and a bonkers digital zoom that goes all the way up to a 50 times magnification this level of magnification blows past competing phones which for the past few years have been stuck with two times or three times zooms the problem for phones is that unlike a normal camera lens there's almost no room to fit all the glass and optic uh, and optics needed to deliver a really long zoom <clears throat> so to solve this problem Huawei installed a mirror similar to a periscope to let the phone bend light down into the phone's body which let Huawei use the length of the P30 Pro to squeeze in optics instead of its thickness. Frankly, this is a development I love because until now, big camera zooms were something you only found on proper standalone cameras. But with the 5 times 10 times zoom on the P30 Pro, you get so much flexibility to get closer to the action. To test this out, I took the P30 Pro and some of its rivals to Madison Square Park and then tried to snap pictures of the Empire State Building from almost 10 blocks away. And the results, well, they speak for themselves. At 5 times and 10 times zooms, the P30 Pro delivered fantastically sharp images. Though as you get closer to 50 times, it starts suffering from the issues inherent with digital enhancement. But the real eye opener is how much more rich the P30 Pro's telephoto cam offers compared to the two time zoom you get on the Galaxy X10 Plus. It's quite a shock. Okay, enough about cameras. What's the rest of the P30 Pro like to use? At this point, it shouldn't be a surprise, but the P30 Pro is a premium device from top to bottom. The P30 Pro is stuffed with all sorts of techie solution, solutions such as both wireless and reverse wireless QI charging, IP68 dust and water resistance, 15 watt fast charging and reverse wired charging as well. And the best color options you can get from any smartphone market today. The P30 Pro even has an higher blaster, which is a feature almost every other phone maker has dropped from their flagship devices. And with a seriously big 4200 mAh battery, the P30 Pro offers ridiculous longevity. On our video rundown test, the P30 Pro lasted 15 hours and 24 minutes, the second longest run time we have seen yet behind only the samsung galaxy folds time of 17 hour and 6 minutes however if i can nitpick a bit i am still frustrated that huawei didn't make room for a 3.5 millimeter jack on the p30 pro as that's a feature you do get on the vanilla p30 aside from the unnecessary bloatware Huawei's EMUI 9.1 skin continues to be a relatively inoffensive take on Android. But at the same time, its somewhat cartoony look and occasionally overly simplistic UI is hard to love. And why the P30 Pro's 6.5 inch OLED screen is impressively bright and colorful. It doesn't suffer slightly from it does suffer slightly from having less overall resolution than you get on a Galaxy S10. It's not a deal breaker, but with a screen that big on a phone that costs close to a thousand buck. If you have good eyesight, you can sometimes notice when text and images don't look quite as sharp as they could. But the P30's 
the P30 Pro's real downside is that it's not really officially supported in the US. While you can get an unlocked P30 Pro from third party retailers like B&H for just $900, $100 le less than most similarly equipped Galaxy S10 Plus, the P30 Pro isn't compatible with CDMA networks like Verizon and Sprint. And if you ever run into a situation where you need customer support, you can't and you can't expect the same kind of care you might get from an Apple or Samsung device. But the impact of what Huawei has done on the P30 Pro is undeniable. If you frequently shoot photos in bars, restaurants, or similarly challenging environments, the P30 Pro's low light capabilities are quite convincing. Meanwhile, that five times optical zoom periscope breaks through to new level of magnification for smartphone cameras. Also because some of the technology used in the P30 Pro zoom system comes from Core Photonics, comes from Core Photonics, a company recently acquired by Samsung for $155 million. You better believe that the five times zoom is something we would be seen on a lot more phones in the future. For the P30 Pro, Huawei set out to push the boundaries of smartphone photography and on not one but two counts, it did. In summary, at 15 hours and 24 minutes, the Huawei P30 Pro has the second, second longest battery life we have ever tested. While you can, while you can buy an unlocked version of the P30 Pro from third party US retailers, the, f the phone doesn't support CDMA networks like Verizon and Sprint and there is not much in the way of local customer support. Huawei starts a new era of smartphone photography by putting a 5 time optical zoom on a phone. Yes, a phone. Almost any feature found on any other high-end premium phone, the Huawei P30 Pro has it too. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day. See you next. Hi guys. Next on Nerdy Tech Reviews, we will be looking at the Zenfone 6. This is a flipping cool $500 phone. Almost as quickly as notches appeared on phones, phone makers started looking for even more aggressive ways to hide a selfie cam including things like punch holes and eating pop-ups. But even among the rare handsets with motorized cameras, the Hesus Zenfone 6 stands alone. This thing is powerful, affordable, and unlike most of its competitors, it has personality. That's because in addition to letting the phone's rear camera transform into a selfie cam, at a moment's notice, the camera's innovative powered inch also lets you capture every angle in between. In a way, it's almost like having a phone that's mounted to one of those fancy slider rigs used in video shoots. Using a handy software slider, you can angle the camera from side to side or switch to a 125 degree ultra wide angle lens if you need a bigger view. The only thing it can do is zoom. But then again, I suppose you would, you've got your legs for that. But manual camera controls are just the start. As Hesus also added some nifty features that takes advantage of the Zenfone 6 cameras adjustability. The first is a special panorama mode that automatic automatically swings the camera up to a full 180 capturing. Up to a full 180 degrees, capturing every angles along the way before switching everything before stitching everything into a single extra wide image. But perhaps even more impressive is the Zenfone's motion tracking feature that takes advantage of the camera's motorized inch to follow a selected subject and hopefully keep them in frame. 
Granted, both of the features are somewhat specialized, but for vloggers or mobile video fanatics, the Zenfone 6 still offers a list of camera features that you can't really get on other devices. Also, for a phone not made by Google, not made by Google, Samsung, or Huawei, the Zenfone's image quality ain't bad. In a short or some happy cows, the Zenfone 6 captured a bright, colorful photo that anyone would be happy to post on Instagram. Though, if you zoom in a bit, you can see that ASOS image processing has resulted in some over sharpening. Next, in a handful of head to head comparison, the Zenfone 6 mostly kept pace with the Galaxy S10 Plus. When snapping a picture of Buddha in a dimly lit restaurant, even though the Galaxy S10 Plus did edge out the Zenfone 6 thanks to a slightly brighter exposure and finer details on the bricks in back, the Zenfone wasn't that far behind. In shootouts to snap some freshly steamed dumplings, the Zenfone 6 once again mostly kept up with the Pixel 3. The Google's HDR Plus processing did give the Pixel the Pixel's picture an advantage in color saturation. However, the one area where ASUS can't quite compete is in very low light situations. That's because while ASUS did give the Zenfone 6 a dedicated night mode, it can't really touch what Google is doing with night sight. Just check out the two pictures of a local street local street mural with local street mural with and without each phone's respective night mode turned on to see what I mean. However, as fun and novel as the Zenfone's camera is, it wouldn't be enough to save the device if everything else was garbage. Thankfully, that's not the case because despite spotting a price tag of around $500, the Zenfone 6 has flagship level specs including a Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 processor, wow, 8GB of RAM up to 256GB of storage, a built-in micro SD card slot, and a headphone jack. That's the same as what you get on Samsung Galaxy S10. Though the S10 Plus does come in a configuration with 512GB of storage if you need it, ASUS has even kept a very light touch on Android 9, offering near stock version of Google's mobile OS. Oh, and the 5000 mAh battery in the Zenfone 6 is just ridiculous. On our video rundown test, it lasted 15 hours and 9 minutes. This puts Zenfone 6 on the same level as much more expensive phones like the Huawei P30 Pro. 15 hours and 24 minutes for the P30 Pro and the Galaxy X10 Plus 15 hours and 9 minutes and with ASUS newly implemented 18 watt quick charge you will be able to juice it back up faster too. Other differences between the Zenfone 6 and the Galaxy S10 includes a rear capacitive touch fingerprint sensor instead of one that's built into, the, into its screen and a dedicated voice assistance button that by default summons goggles instead of Bixby, which is a switch that probably won't upset anyone. You even get stereo sound thanks to the Zenfone's use of a bottom firing speaker that works in conjunction with the thin speaker grills located above the display. The Zenfone 6 is missing a few staples you tend to get on more expensive phones though such as support for wireless charging and water resistance on a phone in, in this price range the lack of wireless charging is sad but somewhat understandable why the lack of wireless charging is almost certainly due to the powered motors that allows the phone's camera to tilt up and down but since the Zenfone 6 camera is also what allows it to not have any distractions 
taken away from its big 6.4 inch screen it might be worthwhile it might it might it might be a worthwhile compromise particularly if you aren't a big fan of taking selfie with a peak brightness of 577 nits the Zenfone 6 has no issues with outdoor visibility but because Asus opted for an LCD panel instead of OLED, colors aren't quite as rich or vibrant as what you would see on a OnePlus 7 or Galaxy S10. But here's the big question, how long is that motorized camera going to survive? Honestly, I have no idea. Asus claimed the Zenfone 6 camera has a reinforced motor with 13 gels which should give the phone some much needed toughness and when you set up the camera to also unlock the phone using face recognition the speed at which the camera comes to our attention is actually pretty impressive but in manual mode tilting the camera isn't really what i would call smooth and the whole time you use it and the whole time you use it you can feel those motors wearing away inside that means depending on what you ask the zenfone's pop-up cam is a whimsical call back to something like a motorized erector set or a haunting reminder of the phone's fragility so even though i spent a good chunk of time with the zenfone 6 worrying if its motorized camera was about to conk out I still can't help but appreciate what ASOS had created compared to other phones in this price range like the Moto Z4 or the OnePlus 16. The Zenfone 6 offers better specs, better battery life and something else you don't find in a lot of phones. Personality. The other choice is trying to choose between the cheaper $400 Pixel 3a and its flagship class cameras or the novel camera and brownie components of the Zenfone 6. In many ways, the Zenfone 6 is a better value, but at the same time, I know not everyone can handle a phone this funky. In summary, the Zenfone 6 specs are as good as the Samsung Galaxy S10, but for half the price. The Zenfone 6 doesn't have support for CDMA networks, which means anyone on Verizon and Sprint is out of luck. Unlike most pop-up cameras that only have two positions, up or down, the Zenfone 6 48 megapixel camera is adjustable throughout its entire range of motion. It even works in third-party photo apps like Instagram too. With a time of 15 hours and 9 minutes on our rundown test, the Zenfone 6 has stupidly good battery life. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. See you next time. Bye. Hi guys. Next on Nerdy Tech Reviews, we would be looking at the Moto Z4, which is a solid mid-range contender but it might be time for a reboot while samsung apple huawei and others continue to push out one thousand dollar phones motorola has run in the other direction and completely abandoned the flagship market that's that's a pretty serious that's a pretty serious about face from just two years ago when Motorola released the $750 Moto Z2 first. Especially when you consider that the Moto, the most expensive phone Motorola makes now is the $500 Moto Z4. However, even with Motorola's more modest ambitions, the company still hopes to deliver on a mid-range device with more premium aspirations. Compared to our current favorite budget phone, the $300 Moto G7, the Moto Z4 offers some significant upgrades, including a 6.39 inch OLED screen, 
some high megapixel cameras in front and back, the biggest battery Motorola has ever put in a Z series phone, and of course, the return of the all important headphone jack. Hell, the Z4 even has an in display fingerprint reader which up till now was a feature found almost exclu exclusively on IN and sets. All told, the Z4 ticks a lot of boxes and avoids any major flaws, aside from one potentially frustrating feature. And yet, even though I kind of like the phone, I am having a hard time feeling much more than that. But let's start with the good stuff. For a $500 phone, the Moto Z4's OLED screen looks great. Colors appear rich and with a peak brightness just shy of 600 nits, 589, 589 nits to be precise. The Z4's luminance is on the same level as many flagship devices. And why the Z4 doesn't have a notch, it's about as unobtrusive as a notch can be and considering any current solution that would allow for an all screen display would easily push the Z4's price not of $500. I'm not bothered and because the Z4's bezels are slimmer than what you get on Pixel 3a or on Pixel 3 or 3a XL you get more usable screen area because while the phone are approximately the same size the pixel 3 xl screens tops out at six inches inside the z4 comes with with a qualcomm snapdragon 675 processor 4 gigabyte of ram and 128 gigabyte of storage that last that last part is a big deal because it's double what you get from a Pixel 3a and that's before you tack an additional storage via the phone's micro SD card slot, a feature the Pixel 3 doesn't have. Despite its Snapdragon 675 chip being a couple steps down from the Snapdragon 855 processor you find in a lot of high-end phones, the Z4 still feels quite snappy, particularly if most of your time is spent browsing the web or checking social media. On Web XP RT 2015, which evaluates web browsing performance, the Z4 score of 258 was just 10% lower than the LG G8 score of 284, though the Galaxy S10 score was much higher at 361. The only time the Z4's performance was ever really an issue was when playing more demanding games like PUBG Mobile or Auto Chess, where you tend to run into a big of lag depending on game settings. Motorola even managed to cram stereo speakers on the Z4, and while audio quality is just okay, it beats the mono speakers you often find on phones in this price range. And then there's the Z4's headphone jack which has finally returned after nearly 4 years when Motorola axed the jack on the original Moto Z. The simple fact that Motorola finally relented under the pressure of consumer complaint is kind of shocking and in a world where companies rarely bring back futures after killing them off the first, after killing them off the first time, some might even say it's courageous Either way, it's a welcome return. I also have to give a special shout out to Motorola for giving the Z4 a 360 mAh battery, the biggest battery ever in a Moto Z phone, as it lets the Z4 last 13 hours and 49 minutes on our battery test. That's an hour longer than the Pixel 3a XL 12 hour 43 minutes and 2 hours longer than the regular Pixel 3a at 11 hours 51 minutes, though the OnePlus 60 still tops them all with a time of 14 hours 37 minutes. Even though the Z4 only has one red cam, it can still shoot portrait shots using simulated bokeh effect. 
As for the Z Force cameras, Motorola gave the, for the phone high resolution shooters on both sides with a 25 megapixel selfie cam up front and a 48 megapixel camera in the back. Both cameras use a technique called pixel binning, binning which combines four adjacent into one big pixel to deliver better low light sensitivity. Strangely, while there is a settings you can adjust to get the selfie cams full 25 megapixel instead of the effective 6 megapixel pics it takes by default, there doesn't seem to be an option to shoot full 48 megapixel shots with the rear cam. In normal condition, the Z4 has very little difficulty snapping insta worthy picture with bright colors and sharp focus. Though when compared to pics from a Pixel 3a, you will notice that the Pixel has an edge in detail. A good example of these differences is the extra level of details you can see on the bricks on the New York Public Library in the Pixel 3a shots below. And in another shot of a nearby stream morale, the Z4 shot appears overexposed and lacks the same level of detail, contrast and dynamic range as what I got from the Pixel 3a. When nighttime rolls around, Motorola also gave the Moto Z4 night vision mode. Because nowadays every phone basically needs to have a special low light shooting mode. Unfortunately, while the Z4's night vision does a decent job of turning up the brightness when it's dark, using night vision also tends to result in a loss of sharpness. Something you can see in both the shot of an outdoor restaurant taken at night and the shot of a croquet taken indoors with the lights turned down. I like I like that Moto stepped up. I like that Motorola stepped up to give customers more tools to deal with challenging low light shots. But considering the Pixel 3 is basically has the same camera as its more expensive siblings, it's tough to beat what remains the best smartphone camera in the in this price range. Finally, we come to the Z Force frustrating features. Even as a fan of in-display fingerprint sensors. The one you get on the Z4 can be a bit of a headache. One of all the phones I have tried with similar tech, the optical fingerprint reader buried underneath the Z4 screen is the least reliable. Sometimes it works perfectly fine, while other times it takes 3 or 4 taps to unlock the thing. With fingerprint recognition appearing to struggle strikingly more when used outside in super bright environments. And there is the z Force modularity. Even after Motorola's 3 year commitment, the z Force still has a trip of pogo pins on its back that lets you connect one of Motorola's 16 or so attachments. With the z Force retail price $100 more than the Pixel 3a or $20 more than the Pixel 3a XL. It sort of feels like you need at least you need to at least have one mode in mind to extract the Z Force full value. But out of Motorola's entire list of modes of mods, there's only two or three that are like the Moto Gamepad, the JBL Sound Boost 2, and maybe the Polaroid Insta Share printer. Assuming shareable retro photos are your kind of thing. That's about it. At $300, the Moto Instant Share Printer and Asul Blood Camera Mode are too expensive to love. And even back when it was released, the Asul Blood Mode picture always looked a bit soft. You are much better off sticking with the Z Force primary camera unless you want that extra zoom. And why at one point there was a wireless charging shell for Motorola Z phones that seems to have gone out of production. Why? The one possible exception is the Moto 5G mod, but not because of that it can do now, but not because of what it can do now, but potentially what it could do in the future. Based on the current state of 5G development, 
there's very little reason for 99.9 percent of people to buy a 5g phone in 2019 but in a year or two when 5g coverage becomes much more widespread the ability to add 5g capability to the z4 for 200 dollars could have you could save you the expense of having to buy a whole new phone but that's a big could because right now the 5g motor mode only works on verizon and there's no word if or when other carriers might put out their own 5g mode the pixel 3a cost less has a better camera and true stock android 9 instead of moto's near stock implementation why the oneplus 60 looks better lasts longer and has way better performance i like the moto z4 and if one of its mods catches your eyes you might too but at this point i wonder if after four years of support for its mod platform maybe it's time for a reboot or a new approach to add some extra excitement to moto z series phones in summary moto gave the z4 a new night vision to help with low light photos unfortunately it's not quite as good as night sight on the pixel 3a while it retails for 500 dollars the z4 does come with some premium features like a vibrant oled screen stereo speakers and an in-display fingerprint reader though the latter can be somewhat finicky after four years and some users complaints motorola finally brought back the headphone jack on the z4 at launch the 5g moto mod is only compatible with moto z4's purchased through verizon unlocked models are slated to get support at a later date the z4 is somewhat water resistant thanks to moto's nano coating but it's not meant to withstand more than a light splash for a limited time the moto z4 would be available for just 240 dollars through verizon with activation of a new phone line thanks for watching have a nice day